So I, I think the, the first question <coughs> that, that we discussed when we were working out what on earth we'd be talking to you about for the next hour or so was um, I mentioned in, in my preamble that we're seeing um, emergence of cooperatives. And in the UK, we've had them for a while, but they've all been tending to be held at the inventory level, the ad level, right, not the data level. Um, we're seeing some data sharing partnerships, you know, second party data exchange happening across publishers here in the UK. But we do see formal consortiums, seems to be a very popular word right now, or um, collaborations, joint ventures between publishers across the rest of Europe. I mentioned um, in, when we were discussing offline off uh, a business called eMetric, I think Dilip referenced it as well, where this is publishers in Germany, probably about 15 or 20, who are getting together to, to pool their data and they're creating a shared taxonomy for the German market, which is mapped against the industry planning um, framework, which is called Agor for the German market. And it's enabling publishers to take back some of the control when it comes to the data space. So I was just wondering, and, and Johan has a view, obviously with his expertise in the, in, the, in the international market, of why that might not be happening here yet in the UK. Um, thank you. Uh, first of all, I'm not um, a German, eh? Just to uh, make you all understand. I'm Dutch, though. <laughs> um, but then again, nobody's perfect. Um, actually, why this is not happening, um, first of all, I don't think that the German example is the best example, to be quite honest, because it's a very few uh, uh, companies working together on a, a very limited uh, scope. Um, and I think what happened is when Dilip showed the, sh the, the slide with all the initiatives that there are, you are competing against uh, Google and Facebook, two names. And they are the same everywhere. And then you can co compete with Amazon, which is not that big in many uh, continental Euro co European countries yet. Uh, but they're bound to, to uh, uh, become a, a major force there too. So you have a lot of initiatives, uh, and they are not really working together at the moment. So I think your sheet proved that point uh, very clearly. Uh, I I'm not familiar with all the initiatives, uh, but the first three were already in the UK. So if you want to make this happen, uh, you need to be uh, really uh, clear in how you want to work together. Um, and, and that's basically the problem, because there are a lot of people there who see each other's, um, uh, or see the other parties as competitors, and they are, but you can find many other areas you can work, in, uh, work together. Okay. Cool. So, so if, we, if we take that, you can find ways to work together. One of the success um, stories in the UK will be something like DAX where you do have publishers working together and collaborating. Yeah. So I thought it might be useful just to have Ryan, for those who are not familiar with, with the way that DAX works, just give it a, a thumbnail sketch of, of how it came to be and, and how publishers are working together. Great, okay, so um, my, my role is ahead of DAX Digital and Mobile at Global, so I kind of wear two hats. One which is DAX specifically, and then digital with global brands, Capital, Classic FM, our apps, our video and digital products. I guess from a, uh, from a digital perspective, it's been a lot more challenging finding alliances with publishers and collectives and actually making it work successfully. What we've done in the UK with audio, so we've taken brands like our radio brands, so Capital, we've collaborated with Bauer, so our competitors, I guess, in the radio space. So we've got brands like Magic, Kiss, Absolute, we've got our Capital, our Classic FM, Heart brands. We've taken radio music streaming brands like uh, SoundCloud and Deezer, We've taken hosting platforms, so podcasts, so Audio Boom, Blog Talk, that have multiple different podcasts within these networks. The challenge was four years ago before we launched is the fragmented market. It's difficult to go and access all of these different markets at one point. Um, the scale wasn't there. So actually, we decided to do something about that and launch a collective that we call DAX, Digital Audio Exchange, that brings all of those things that I've just referenced together in one central platform to make it easier for advertisers, clients to access the audio market at scale. So, you know, before we even went to market, the, the conversations were speaking with the likes of Bauer and saying, right, look, you know, let's collaborate, let's launch an initiative, and let's see how successful that we can be, because working individually is just challenging, and it's something that agencies were, they, they weren't familiar with. Obviously, audio is a relatively new medium, um, so, so we needed to really work together to sort of drive the awareness, to build up a network of, of publishers, um, to build up a network of these pu publishing platforms, streaming services, radio brands, to give enough scale to be able to go to the market and say to clients, right, okay, you can now access a UK audio market in one central point. And this resonated so well with agencies because I think it's something that they've been crying out for so long. You know, they'd, they'd wanted to easily access something where they didn't have to have 20 different conversations, where they didn't have to think about the different buying metrics, different price points, um, different data audiences, um, 
speaking to 20 different people, IO based. Uh, so the idea is that we kind of tried to evolve this product over the last three years and when we launched in 2014 to where it is now is staggering. We launched with three and a half million users. We've now got 16 million monthly users within DAX. And this then allows us to go to the market as a collective. So when we talk about audio, it's, relative, it's one voice. Um, there are some nuances, so Spotify aren't within DAX, but ultimately it's one voice that we can go to the market and we can decide how, how we position a medium, how we work and how we collaborate. So I guess one of the big things around collaborating is that we've had to get over ourselves collectively and say, OK, let's all work together for the greater good. And I think that that's one challenge that publishers face in the UK now from a digital or display perspective of, OK, how can we do that? How can we work together effectively and go up against the likes of the Googles and the Facebooks and, and, and win, I guess, or at least start taking a bigger slice of the, the advertising pie? So how successful are you compared to Google and Facebook? Um, of market share unfortunately, or money not as much or money, or I'd be paid a lot more money than I am now. Um, but I think, from a success perspective, um, we've launched multiple different products. Um, we've integrated multiple different data platforms. And I think one of the, the good things and one of the, the fantastic success stories of UK publishers here is we've started working with other publishers up on data sharing. So we've been able to collaborate with some brilliant publishers like. Uh, uh, like Evening Standard, uh, like Haymarket, like Dennis, like Zoopla. And we build these data partnerships, map audiences, and then try and help publishers monetize their audience in did, a new environment. Did it also help the agencies to have less work on uh, the buying, the planning, the, uh, the ordering and everything like that? Absolutely, yeah. In terms of how much money does it save? I mean, it's a significant because amount of time. It, it's, uh, sorry, it, can I ask another question here? Because I don't really know which audience I have in front of me. Uh, how many of you are actually representing publishers? And how many of you represent me, uh, digital or uh, uh, internet only? Online only? OK, good. So everybody has more than one medium to sell mm -hmm. here. So how much work does it save when I have to go and buy uh, an ad on a radio channel or an audio channel and then go to you and then also go to uh, Google because they have YouTube, which also has a lot of listeners? How much work does it save me on an average uh, day? Well, so, I mean, there, there's two points. So one, there's direct IO-based buy, which saves time because you don't need to go and speak to 30, 40 different public. So it saves a lot of time. But what we've also done is enable programmatic market as well so ultimately now we've integrated with a number of different DSPs which now allow the agency train desk to access the audio market as well as direct IO so if you think about efficiencies the whole reason programmatic came about was efficiencies okay, so we've just enabled the the, the market so my, my point is that I don't think we should compete or try to compete with Google and Facebook because you will never ever no. win they are bigger they are better they have their own environment the famous uh, walled gardens so for Facebook, I go to Facebook and that's it. And I get all the data and everything in a wonderful dashboard and, and planners love it. Yeah, absolutely. Now, if I have to go outside these walled gardens, and we've done uh, research uh, in the Netherlands last year, it takes 12 minutes for uh, somebody to buy and order and do all the traffic related to a banner or a video ad or whatever. That's 12 minutes in a world where we are looking for real-time online uh, reporting. Those 12 minutes are gone. Now, if I have to duplicate this with I don't know how many publishers, also in different countries, because there are agencies working, uh, I saw Karat here earlier, for instance, for uh, Microsoft and Philips, and they work out of the Netherlands for various countries, they have to do this I don't know how many times in a day. So there we have Google who will say, I'll take this from you. I have my data set, and we get back to the value of that later, perhaps. but. Um, this is it. This is the world, and the only thing you have to do is be in this environment, and I'll take care of everything. How can you compete with that? So, so if you're, you're talking about consolidation, I guess I'd, I'd first of all be interested to know what your solution would be, because you know I, th I think one of the reasons you have fragmented buying points is that we, as individuals, and I will keep coming back to this term, individual, we don't spend all of our lives within the Google environment or the Facebook environment. So until there is one overall consortium of all the talent which I think is unlikely to happen, that you are in this realm of having to buy the place which is most appropriate for your and This is why I was asking if there are uh, people here who represent an online-only company. Because what you have going for you are two things. First of all, you always have more to offer than the Googles and the Facebook because you have other media types. And those types are totally different. We've just done the, the research now in, in the Netherlands between the overlap of the digital audience versus the 
uh, let's say, traditional print audience, and there's hardly any overlap. Uh, for newspapers, it's about 30 to 40 percent, so that's substantial. But for magazines, it's under 20, most of the times under 15 percent. So you have two different audiences. You can offer to your advertisers and the agencies. And this is where more and more advertisers are interested in, because they want to know the overlap and the incremental reach you can deliver. And you can, and this is where you can compete. And the other thing you have going for you is that you always offer local content. This is, and, and sometimes it's very local and the other times it's regional or national, uh, but it's always content which is much closer. And I think uh, Alison uh, said this earlier, uh, it, you need to be relevant, nothing has changed, and you need to be closer to the, close to the uh, end user, the consumer. And Google and Facebook can't offer that. This is more than uh, what, uh, what you were saying earlier on uh, what, what you said it had to be trust or what you can offer all together, trustworthy and stuff like that. That can be true, but it's not the way it's perceived by the users, by the people who actually consume the contents. Because they go to YouTube also for an instruction video and they get education uh, also online from, from YouTube and sometimes even from Facebook. And even if we don't trust it, the audience does. So you can't compete on that uh, on that uh, aspect. Yeah, so. I don't think I was particularly talking about trust. I was talking about a context that, that frames certain decisions. And so, um, and actually, uh, this point about do agencies care? Does, do clients care? Uh, do they want to put the time into it? I, mean, I wasn't just kind of saying we've had a few discussions with some mates down the pub. We're being pressured by agency groups. The biggest bias saying find ways to come together around this yeah. thing. We, you, you need to, we need it. How can we do this in partnership? How can we have friendly pitches together? How can we build a product together? That is the level of discussion. It's not uh, uh, us saying, it, it's, it's probably a little bit different to, to in, in that respect to what Brian, uh, Brian excuse me, <laughs> Ryan, <laughs> sorry, uh, it's been a long time. What, what Ryan was talking about, I'm guessing, I was gonna ask you actually, it sounded to me like you're, I was wondering what those initial discussions went like when you're talking to Bauer, you know, yeah. <laughs> shout, let's work together, guys. You know, what did that discussion sound like? Because uh, this feels like a different thing that says uh, the agencies are literally dragging us in there, you know, and we've got to figure out something on the way in. I mean, it's not like that, but, you know, there's that pressure that maybe there wasn't, I don't know, when you first came together. No, I think, I mean, there's always challenges. There's, there's different business models, pricing models and concerns. But I think, as I said, it's a greater good of being able to work, collaborate together to build a market. Let's just say in two or three years' time, it may look completely different. You know, once specifically, not all did, but for audio, the market will then get larger. Then obviously there will be then different ways it can evolve. So it, 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 it works successfully as a collective to start with. And I think that's the same principle when we spoke to our publisher partner. So Evening Stand, we sat down, we spoke to them, or Haymarket, or or Dennis Publishing. <coughs> we sat down and had those challenging conversations around. Right, okay, we're publishers. We compete for similar budgets. I think where the success has come from is that we are audio specifically, and the publishers are digital budgets. Where actually we're not taking money; it's new money. So it's a way of extending the reach and also extending uh, their, their data and being able to monetize that off-site, which is a massive, it's a new revenue stream for publishers. I mean, I'm not saying we've cracked it and it's working perfectly. I would say we've got 10, 15 publisher partnerships that we've started seeing lots of demand from clients for. You know, clients have cried out, agencies have cried out and said, publishers work together more effectively. Why doesn't... Dennis talked to Haymarket, and why doesn't uh, Auto Trader as well? And how can we work together from an auto perspective? That is happening more. They do talk. We always have these conversations. There's much better relationships now than there's ever been. But I do think that there's still ways in which we need to sort of attack the market and, and, and get bigger budgets, not just kind of smaller budgets. And that's a nice to have on a plan. Yeah. It needs to be a big I, part of a plan. I, I, I think if I can jump in, I, I think one of the challenges also that we're seeing is that agencies aren't sitting still here waiting for you guys to come together, right? No. The agencies are also aware of the power of data and they are looking to consolidate data as well. Mm. So there are a number of conversations going on where agencies would like to be able to harvest, harvest is the wrong term, <laughs> would like to be able to utilize uh, data from across their clients, mm -hmm. so getting their clients to collaborate, the brands that they work with, pooling their data to create a shared sense of identity. And then they're going to come to you guys and say, you know, actually these rebates and margins, they've worked as well so far, but we're under a bit of pressure now in terms of being, having those scrutinized. What we'd like instead from you is alternative value. We're building this graph proposition. We would like you to give us your data. In return, we'll give you a trading commitment. 
And if you are unilaterally stood there negotiating, you're very exposed to the yeah. power of an agency mm -hmm. block coming to you saying, we would like to utilize your data and in return you'll get a watch of cash, particularly given you're under the pressure in terms of um, maintaining revenue streams online and in the face of, of competition from Google and Facebook. So also, I'm, I'm just yeah. curious to know how, how, the, how the panelists would, would handle that and how you guys would, would think of handling because it is going to happen if it hasn't already. They are going to be wanting to have those discussions with you. Mm. We faced it for for a long time. Agency trained desk building network of publishers that they can then you know premium publish and they trade across, and that's a control in their hands. And it's not necessarily in our hands, yeah, which is the most important piece, I guess. To your point, you know, it's been in existence for a long time. There's access model. Publishers now have taken a lot more of a keen interest from a display from video perspective, mm -hmm. building quality pools of inventory, safe inventory, paying slightly higher premiums, but they're in control of how things buy and how much money they spend. The challenge is the flip side, and we've seen stuff we mentioned before, Pangea, where there's alliances like the FT uh, uh, and the Guardian, but it probably hasn't gone far enough, and I don't think there's been enough publishers involved to sort of drive that agenda and sort of be in the, uh, on the front foot as opposed to the back foot. But it's never going to work if you leave it up to the publishers only. It has to come from the agency saying, I want you to do this and work in this way. Mm. And so to answer your question, how do we do this? This is by moving budgets one way to another. Now, I know you don't do this in the UK, so it's easy for me to say. In the Netherlands, it works that way. Of course, it doesn't work uh, exactly that way, but this is what we told them. And last year, we, we tr started building what we first called the PMA Ad ser uh, Server. Politically, that didn't go down very well. Uh, so we changed it, not the concept, but the name, uh, in AFS, Agency File Server, <laughs> which is basically doing very much the same. Uh, it starts with automatically generating a tag, just to save us all the work. Um, and then it goes into cyberspace. Uh, I'll leave out all the details. But the idea is that everything which is coming from one of our agency, agencies is being, uh, can be followed, both programmatic and direct buy, premium buy. So we end up with a discussion with the, with the publisher saying, but we have two uh, concerns. One is, one is data loss. Of course, whenever you go from one station to another, you lose some kind, somewhat of the data. And the other is what is euphemistically called data leakage. Uh, basically, that means everybody can get access to the data. And they were very worried that we would get data which would enable us to retarget on their uh, uh, audiences. That used to be a problem because that data or retargeting from premium buy is more expensive than from programmatic buy. Now we had a wonderful situation last year just before Christmas on uh, the inventory of a, a, a TV uh, broadcaster, uh, the digital inventory, that the prices for uh, premium were lower than the prices for programmatic. And actually now we see that both prices are really getting uh, to each other. We have about <laughs> 70% in volume in the Netherlands is programmatic buy, uh, which is quite high, I believe, in Europe. Um, so we said, first of all, if the prices are more or less the same, it doesn't really matter. And secondly, and this is what really annoyed me talking to the publishers, is we said, listen, what we do is we create additional business for you, revenues, because you create data we like to have, and we were willing to pay for it. Now, I don't know how much, uh, but we're willing to pay for it. And we agree to the principle that data which is generated by your uh, efforts, whether it's uh, uh, mobile or, or uh, through cookies or uh, pixels or whatever they do, the data we get from there is your data. So we won't steal it from you, but we, will, we would like to need it uh, to use it. And then we ended up with a discussion on encryption, which is totally <coughs> irrelevant and um, no, it's not irrelevant, but let's say at least it's time consuming and doesn't lead to anything else. The, the discussion should be how much money can we make from this additional um, uh, uh, data source. And how did you address that? So how do you share the value back to the, the publishers that are contributing? We just went there? directly to Google with edX and SpotX and we said, we're going to work with you and make this happen. And once it's there and it is there, we're going to start discussing with you again. So then it's there. So the threat is, if you don't cooperate, we will introduce it. OK. Yeah? Yep. We like to cooperate, and we will cooperate, and we will pay you for it, but you have to start talking to us. OK. So that kind of brings us on to one of the challenge questions that I wanted to ask, which was w one of the things that we found from talking to publishers is if you look at moving to a more people-based rather than device and cookie-based way of working, is you're having to, just in the advertising sales programs you offer, you're having to change, you're having to retool how you, how you bring that to market. And you know, whether that's packaging, 
at an individual level rather than an impression level, pricing at an individual level rather than an impression level, just retooling everything that you work, retraining your sales guys. So I'm just wondering if there's any learnings you can, you can offer from DAX in terms of how you approach that in terms of the initial go-to-market thrust and how the, the team people out here might look at that. I think it's just a slow, it's an education piece. It's understanding how the, like from a data perspective, it's understanding how that audit data was collected. So publisher-wise, you know, lots of publishers work with Crux. You know, I, I was at the Telegraph before I came to Global and we work with Crux. So it was first understanding, okay, how do we sell data? How do we articulate that to the market? Then you're bringing new nuances in, different data areas. You've got to understand how these audience segments are built and created. I think if you're then talking about people as opposed to sort of cookie or IDFA, you're all of a sudden then thinking, right, now I'm saying something different to the market. So it's not just re-educating your commercial sales team, it's re-educating the agencies that you've been talking to, the agency trading desks, other publishers, all being able to speak the same language. Because otherwise you end up with some people talking about cookie IDFA based and then people based mm -hmm. marketing. You're then muddying the waters again and that's where the challenges have always been. You know, people talking about different ways. And I think if you're a publisher and you're going to talk about something specific, then a, a guardian go and talk about something different about how they collect their data and how they use their targeting. It's just confusing buyers. It's confusing agencies and trading desks, which is complete opposite of what we want. Because I feel like we've got to quite a good place where lots, everyone pretty much understands, OK, how audiences are built, created, and how publishers, what their model is. If we are going to change this again and go to people-based for publishers, then that needs to be more collective. That needs sure. to be one voice to market because otherwise it's going to be very, very challenging. And Dilip, in your conversations with the agencies, I mean, they're asking, you know, how do you guys work together to make it easier for us to buy from you? Do you get a sense that they're, they're going to put the money where their mouth is? Do they see a premium based on this way of working? Uh, so I think it's, yeah, I mean, I think that the, the, the carrot is, that is dangled is you know, a more strategic relationship and more strategic budgets. And I've, I've, sort of, I've done media plans before where I've said, like, OK, uh, I'm going to do this with The Telegraph. And it's, it's a, the Telegraph's a, a big property. We'll have a, a campaign that is just one of the things that this automotive client would do. Whereas you, you don't have that kind of discussion with Facebook and Google. The discussion you have is, I'm going to put all of my stuff with you, whether it's brand or promotional, all of my models, because you can tell me who I should be targeting, all of those. In fact, you seem to know more about my customer than I do. Therefore, I'm going to give you a strategic budget. And what's left is what publishers end up uh, having to uh, scrap over. And it's, uh, it's an, as we know, a pot that isn't growing. Therefore, as we're invited into those discussions, it is for a strategic relationship and not a tactical relationship. Uh, it can happen at a number of levels. And I, was, I was trying to uh, allude to that uh, in what I was saying, which is that, OK, here, you know, let's target people first, because actually there, there, so much comes with that. Uh, it isn't just the fact that you can do the right kind of attribution and all the rest. It's You can actually then communicate with someone for who they are, right? and, and you can do the insight piece and really understand. Um, but you don't have to do all of those things. You just have to have pieces of those starting to come together and agree them you know, one at a time. And it might be that one group of publishers works slightly differently than another group or whatever. Uh, obviously, um, the more that work together, the clearer the offer and the better uh, the, the, the story that goes to market. But going back to your question, yes, there is definitely more money in this offered from the agencies. And also, there's a, I don't want to go on too long, but they, um, this is the right time. Okay? They're, mm -hmm. they're under pressure from uh, Facebook, Google, and other entities. They're trying to build something that, uh, f mainly from premium publisher data, actually, that becomes their product. Uh, but of course, there is now regulation that means that you have to think differently about what you do with someone's data, and publishers become the source for consent to that data as well. So, OK, how do you make that work the right way? Well, actually, you, you, well, we're being invited to the table to talk to mm. uh, those agencies about that. And so um, uh, this discussion isn't just a sort of discussion that says, wouldn't it be nice if? It's kind of like, well, it's there. You know, what, what are we going to do now? Let's, let me add something positive for a change. <laughs> Otherwise, you still believe I'm German. Um, <laughs> the, the, um, two years ago, Google uh, issued a press release in Germany uh, saying that they are, are entitled to 21% of TV budgets. Now, if you ask somebody from, Ger from Google how did they come up with the 21%, they said it's easy, we have 21%, no, we have about uh, four times more value when it comes to GRPs, online video, 
Um, and we have about, uh, uh, what was it, uh, 6%, um, something like that, uh, GRPs. So we need 21%, uh, we are entitled to. Now, if you then go and look at what Google calls GRPs, it starts. And I'm pretty sure you work with the same GRPs as we do in, uh, on the continent. In the GRP, there's always a, a, a length uh, aspect, a time, a duration aspect. So a start is not a GRP, because it's a millisecond. And this is discussion, uh, or discussion, this is the, 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 the problem with Facebook last year, they had to admit. Uh, just going through a timeline and having a, a video started is nothing. Um, in the Netherlands, we have calculated that the total GRP uh, uh, inventory of Facebook <laughs> and Google is about 4%. That's 4%. That's 96% with traditional broadcasters. Um, and also a certain amount with traditional publishers who now have video. Hearst discovered video last year, uh, for instance. So um, that's one thing everybody has going uh, for them. The local publishers uh, have, or the non-American uh, publishers have, or the traditional print publishers have going for them. Um, and I think we forget that every now and then. And the other thing is that if you work together, um, it's not that difficult because you can start with working together on smaller issues where you easily agree. Um, I'm uh, managing a, a, an association of agencies uh, with independent agencies and big network agencies. Now, we don't have the situation like you have in the UK here. Our group M is about 35% of the market, so <coughs> they are not that dominant. Uh, IPG uh, media brands and, and uh, OMG are probably together uh, bigger. Um, but it means that you have to go and look for what you have in common. And that's not so difficult because you, all, you have a lot of things in common, but that's not necessarily just your anger or competition against Facebook and Google, because you will never ever win. But you don't need to, to compete with them because part of the money which is now going to them, you can easily get back by having better offers, by having a better sales force and being more equipped. I was in, in, on the uh, publishing and data research forum, as it's called now, Two years ago, that was here in London, and last week or the week before, that was in Madrid. And then you see what you can do with uh, data and, uh, uh, let's say, online and print uh, together. Um, and, and that's something you will have going for you always. But you need to, to be assertive about that and stop comparing yourself to Google and Facebook. They're in a different league. But you can still easily make money. So Dilip, throwing it to you, how do the AOP and the publisher members assert themselves <laughs> against Google and Facebook and demand I, a larger share of revenue? Well, I just feel yeah. like I'm not in complete agreement with what Johan's saying. Um, and I'm, I'm not suggesting that, uh, that the, the kind of opportunity of bringing premium publisher data together is something that uh, would smash Google and Facebook into the, the next century. It doesn't need to. It no. needs to supply a, a need in the market, which is that clients and advertisers are there saying, I need to be able to understand who a person is. I, want, I need to understand it with precision. I want insight into who they are. And please let me target them at scale with some attribution. And you can so, do that. And along the way, I think that you can start to, to fill those pieces in and take strategic revenues. And, and so um, I think that that's the... Uh, the opportunity. I know I was kind of uh, repeating myself a bit there, but um, it, to me it just seems that the question is uh, not will it work, it's a question of what's it going to be? You know, what, what kind of cooperations are going to happen? How quickly can we get around the table and just start to discuss the specifics of what it will be? Yeah. I think it's also important to know that you know clients and agencies want to buy out. They, they don't want to put all their money into Google and Facebook. Mm -hmm. no. So we need to be able to give them a clear reason as to why they're not going to do that. And I think if that is via more efficiencies, better data, maybe that's collective, then that's, that's the reason. So it's even more important to collaborate and work together. Because the opportunity is there and the, and the want is certainly there for, for maintenance that I've spoken But to. it's also internally, because it's not that I want to promote the richest uh, company uh, even more, but um, <laughs> I don't know how many um, of you actually have one login for somebody who wants to uh, be across all your channels or titles. Can you follow this uh, consumer? <coughs> because I know from experience that if you go and you log in on the uh, part which is connected to TV, and then you have to have a different login, or worse, even with the same login and a different password, you can yeah. log in into another domain. So you have one consumer, and you don't even know it's one consumer. So if you start there, because that's what Google and Facebook do yeah. pretty well, I would say, yeah. um, uh, you can work on that. And that's something you can, 
if you don't have the money to develop it on your own, you can do this together as an industry because you're not competing there. Yeah. So do you see that happening in the Dutch market? I mean, it's happened in Portugal, right? The two leading media owners there. It is happening have. because we are demanding it. We, we don't want to spend so that, all our time going through 15 different data sets with one publisher because he has 15 different data sets. Make it one. So that, that's quite a useful forcing function, which is if you don't do this, you don't get any ad spend. But how, <laughs> how, how might you... It, it's, it's not that black and white, of course, but you will get less or you will get more problems or you will be l later on in the, in the food chain. Or So what, what do you guys see as the, the barriers to entry of doing that? <laughs> well, no, it'd be interesting to know exactly what, what are the data pieces that people want. Is it standard data pieces? Is it contextual? Is it well, it's, everything, it's, everything all encompassing? Is it age, gender? Is, what's the data that is in such uh, high demand? And okay, we started with the Dutch Phoenix, which is the Dutch AOP, <coughs> and they wanted a traditional list of about 5,000 uh, um, social demographics, <laughs> criteria, brand users, and you name it. That didn't work. <laughs> Now, trying to get this from 5,000 down to 100 is kind of impossible. So we did it the other way around. We said, forget about this. I went to ask the agencies, <laughs> give me the 15 or give me the most uh, important uh, uh, criteria on which you make your plans. And surprise, surprise, that's about 12. Yeah. And we have seven lifestyle uh, 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 criteria. So that's, it's, imp it's age, it's your place in the family, it's education, it's where you live. Um, uh, it's, well, a few of these are gender. Um, there's things like that. So it's, it's 12 social demographics we use. And, and we do about 85% of that. Now, if you ask an agency, what would you like to have? And I recommend you don't ask an agency, <laughs> what would you like to have? You get a very long list. Yeah. Now, if you ask them, what do you need? because agency are, are workers are very pragmatic, they will give you a few uh, items. And that's what you should ask. What do you need to get your work done? And mm -hmm. then you get something you can work with and it's affordable to deliver. <laughs> We're not that bad people. We are. <laughs> so that seems to be lending, leading towards the, the, kind of the, the more the e-metric way of working, which is a standard taxonomy, even for a few variables, which you then drip into the market and test. I was going to... Um I'm not trying to say that we should slavishly follow what Facebook and Google have done. All I'm saying is they've defined what data is in the market to a client, uh, and that's what's to be yeah. learned from. Uh, and if you were to learn further from what they've done, you, you would then say, OK, we haven't focused this on what agencies want. We've focused it on what clients need. And we've gone to clients through each vertical. We've built a, a deep understanding of the valuable verticals. And we've gone to the automotive clients, and we've said to them, Here's what you didn't know about your customers. This is the journey they go on. These are all the ways that you can communicate with them. I think that's something that is, you know, uh, it's complex but possible uh, within uh, our membership coming together. Um, and and I, and I do believe that those, you know, those different categories are signal. The different interests are there. Um, I'm, I'm not saying it's a simple uh, five-minute job, but I, I'd say if you wanted to learn from that that's what you would do. Mm. Um, and, I, and I think that's also something that takes you away from, I think it's, a, I don't know, I, I feel more aligned to that way of thinking. I'm not saying it's the, the ultimate solution, but if you then start saying, oh, agency just wants coverage of everything and a bunch of audience breaks that it can buy, you cut yourself off from the insight opportunity that a client needs and the relationship that that can build. Yeah. And that is ultimately where the value comes from. So. Uh, yeah, That's it, where I'd go. It is, Chad, because we, you know, clients, agencies want more insight than ever before. So if you're sticking to 10 audience segments that are relatively generic, the five, six, seven years of work that publishers have done of building a unique proposition, understanding the nuances around their audiences, how they behave, the insight, in theory, you're technically saying that's all, all wasted. No, I'm not saying it's all wasted because, mm. we, and now we'll go back to what I said earlier, because in the end, we want the incremental and uh, exclusive uh, reach. Um, and, and of course the, the overlap. Uh, for, to be able to do that, you need more uh, social demographics right. than just the 10. But I'm saying if you don't have the money and you start cooperating, why not start with, let's say, an entry level? Make yeah. it simple for yourself and build from there. Um, and I don't, I think, Dilip, that the world you are picturing is a wonderful world 
Uh, I would really love to live in that. Um, oh, but put. <laughs> in the end, I said pragmatic. Agency people are pragmatic. They are opportunistic as well. They are uh, change aversive. But they are also brilliant people when it comes to dealing with data. And give them some data and they can crunch all kinds of numbers and actually get, give meaning to it, which I think mm -hmm. is, is probably one of the greatest assets agencies can deliver. But they also understand the clients and what they want, but not every day um, on a day-to-day -day level. Yeah. So you make your plans and we don't lo no longer make annual plans either, like uh, all the other um, uh, consultants are, are, are now doing everything on a more ad hoc basis. But on a daily basis, uh, ads need to be bought. <coughs> yeah. And we do that pretty much the same as we used to do, because now we call it data, because it's coming from online. But we had data, we called it ratings, or we had data, we called it GRPs, or we had data, we called it uh, whatever. Um, there's nothing really new about that. We still handle data the way we used to do. And on a, on a let's say, well, you called it before, I believe, holistic, or on a larger scale, we do this once a year, and then we do the, the observations um, sessions uh, like you just uh, pitched it. Uh, but on a day-to-day -day business, we just need to buy. And it's a lot of work, and it's, uh, it's uh, yeah, I was, a zoom out there. I'm not without sympathy for what you're saying. Um, uh, what I would suggest is that actually uh, maybe what I'm talking about <laughs> is something that's further along the line that's enabled by the, that initial early steps. And I would say that actually would begin with people-based marketing. <laughs> Uh, and then you'd start, which in immediately enables the things that follow from that. It enables more scale, it enables more insight, and it allows Sorry. you to start doing those things. And I think that that would be uh, a way forward. But uh, So we've, we've talked a little bit about, or quite a lot about, application of data for targeting purposes. And to Johan's point, there are challenges there in terms of taking incremental share of revenue back from, from the Googles and the Facebooks. But th those types of companies are called walled gardens for a reason, right? So the, getting the data out of them is quite a challenge. So I'm just wondering if there's a, an alternative way to look at this, which is around how do you extract data from publishers? How do you utilize it for better measurement, better attribution, better reporting, which is maybe a different way into collaboration? Mm. I mean, it might be something more partnership-based with those buyers and the clients that says, OK, let's, we will be more open with you for, well, for two reasons. First of all, because it will get us moving faster. But secondly, because we'll share the load of delivering insight from the information and turning it into something more valuable. So, but I don't want to... Uh, I, I can see from the screen in front of me we have two questions that have come up from the floor. So we'll, we'll hand one across to Ryan, which is, how much did the DAX initiative grow the market and how has this affected Global's market share? Um, well, obviously, within DAX, you've got the global brand, so our eight brands within it. But, I mean, from a radio perspective, broadcast, the market's grown, I think, back end of... We'll be going in from a radio perspective in high to low double di digit growth of broadcast and we're still seeing significant growth from DAX so it hasn't had an effect on the global revenues if, if anything it's a halo effect of audio radio as a whole um, probably one of the key things that we've done is it's allowed <coughs> us to understand what role audio plays on the media plan so we've developed some techno technology that allows us to measure post listen attribution this means someone's heard an audio ad we can then track them to a site that performed an action and tell you a load of insight and information off the back of that. We can now see when someone's listened to a radio ad, be it on Capital or, or, or Absolute or KISS, have they gone through to a client site and performed an action or purchased a product? You know, is that something that didn't exist before? So if anything, it's allowed us to understand more about a user, about where before, previously, from a radio or broadcast perspective, we didn't have that information, we didn't have that insight. So this has given more insight. It's allowed us to create audiences. It's allowed us to trade this programmatically, which has then had interest more from digital buyers. So we've started getting budgets, not just from Mavie teams. We've got budgets from the digital teams. We're seeing um, so a, a, a consistently a halo effect of revenue out of the market, which is, um, which is good for the market. It's been great for radio, and it's been great for, 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 for audio as a whole. On top of that, you've got Spotify in the market that have been going out for the last five or six years, a great product. We've worked collectively with these guys to ensure that we're talking about audio. We're growing the market. So I would say, from a, from a global perspective, it's only had a positive effect. Okay. There was a, another question that came up earlier, which was, uh, how do we go about creating a, a set of rules around how data is grouped and shared across publishers? So I'll ask Dilip to answer first, but then I'll ask <laughs> Johan to counter, because he may have a different view. Uh, yeah, so... Um, Dilip? Uh, well... I, I, I would always go 
I'm tempted to go for the higher uh, value play, which is a, a, and the more fundamental play, which is about insight. Um, and I think that that will direct you into putting the right sets together. I think otherwise you're doing something that is second hand. It might be uh, quicker immediate revenue, but second hand because it's basically saying I want I want to put an audience proxy together rather than the thing that the, the advertiser and the client is targeting. So um, I think those those groups that are you know demographically led with a few sort of herbs and spices in there uh, are. Uh, something that's useful, but not as powerful as saying, what are the audience groupings that give me better insight into who a customer is? Yeah, and you talked about the need maybe to start operationally with a few attributes. Where do you see that eventually to going? You see it remaining a, a small handful of, of, of core attributes? or Well, to, to share um, um, Dilip's level of uh, conversation or uh, discussion, um, if you look at the, uh, this world, you have two groups of people. Uh, the people, uh, the old generation, my generation, who are used to work with probabilities, OTSs and stuff like that. And then you have a, a much younger group who is into uh, zeros and one, digital. It exists or it doesn't exist. This, so we have target audience in the one group with the probabilities, and we have profiles in the other group who's on zeros and ones. Uh, we now see a whole new uh, breed of people, 25, 30 year olds coming in, um, uh, who actually don't have this distinction anymore. They are just people who say, what does the client want? And for these people who will work in the future and decide on the future, um, we need to have uh, profiles and uh, target groups overlapping. So we, we don't have this misunderstanding anymore. Um, and uh, as Alison was saying, we need new jargon. Somebody has to come up with a, a name for this and we can find something new. Um, but this is where I think the, the twain shall meet uh, and when we don't have these discussions anymore because it is both, both uh, the target groups, the, the groups you're looking for, the profiles, but you can only deliver this if you can actually uh, prove to us, the agencies, that the data you're delivering is not longer devices and individual devices, but actually this consumer journey everybody's talking about. And so far we haven't been able to do this. So what we need is to agree on how to do this. And uh, a part of that is, is simple audience measurement, which online is everything but simple. Um, but we work on that. And, and for instance, now we have in the Netherlands, uh, we're working on one RFP for all research audience measurement research. So for the radio, or we call it now audio, for video, uh, that's including linear watching and uh, uh, online, uh, for print, nothing much will change there, I think, for online mm -hmm. specific, uh, or for online only. And that will all, is, uh, we are preparing this now in, all, in one RFP. So we have the requirements from all sides, and we're trying to make this into one RFP now. And actually, it's not that difficult. We thought it was impossible. But once you start working on it, and you, you get to the level of requirements, um, uh, and you define them not as we used to, uh, then it, it looks like it can actually work. OK. So uh, we'll, we'll stay with JM for a minute, because someone's yeah. kindly raised the thorny topic of GDPR, and has asked, uh, in, in GDPR, specifically the need for user consents, Will this affect the level of data sharing? So obviously in the, in the Netherlands, you have a higher standard of consent right now. And obviously that's going to increase again <coughs> under, under the GDPR when it comes into effect in May 2018. But how, do you see that having an impact in terms of this sort of collaboration? I think May, um, what is it, 26th, um, that will be a day without online advertising. Um, <coughs> but um, Nobody knows exactly what this will mean because we haven't. Everybody has still different uh, ideas. If you're lucky, you uh, have your uh, Brexit executed before then, um, and otherwise you will have the same problems as we have. Nobody actually knows what this will mean in in practice because we haven't seen the the, the complete set of rules. The only thing I know, and uh, I don't know, there's still the Google representative in the room. Um, but uh, Google said until two months ago, we're not that worried with GDPR. And what I understood now is they have 1,200 people working on it. So somehow <laughs> they see some urgency there uh, too. It's a small percentage of the total. I, I mean, don't think right, that's, how, how you at this for I don't think that's I mean, an exaggeration. Have... I think they literally have got yeah, you know, I'm not hundreds making it of up. people. Oh, you think I was exaggerating all the time? 
Oh. <laughs> Go on. I mean, Ryan, you must have looked into GDPR for, for DAX. Yeah, Has I mean, it led you to any, any conclusions or changing process or way of working? As a business, to be honest, it's not just for DAX, it's for everything that yeah. we do at Global. So it's, you know, we've had a consultant since the start of the year. Obviously, we haven't got all the answers, but I guess what we do know is that we just need to ensure that we're doing the right things, the right practices. Um, and also, working you know, at the AOP, we've been, there's been a consortium for the last sort of six months talking about GDPR. I think that's where the publishers can, can, can benefit working mm -hmm. together from what you know, different learnings, different results that come out of different conversations. I think the key thing for us is to make sure that we have our house in order first. And then obviously some of the other publishers that we work with. And I think one of the good things from a data perspective is we do work with other publishers, premium publishers, meaning they'll be doing the right things around GDPR, which is a massive tick. It's maybe some of the other data providers, like the third-party data providers, yeah. where there may be challenges. But we just need to make sure that as long as we're working with the right ones that are doing the right things, it should be business as usual. I mean, certainly our view would be the fact you have direct consumer relationships stands you in very, very good stead yeah. in terms of obtaining the right consents to then utilize your data, first-party data. I think you've correctly identified third-party data as, as a more gray area. Mm -hmm. I think I'd just like to add that the, um, the AOP GDPR working group is a magnificent example of publishers working together, yeah. sharing information and looking into uh, this and, and, and uh, out of this will come uh, some information that all members will be able to use. Mm. Uh, we're looking at the different use cases for data, we're looking at you know, where data comes from, what the consent is, where it goes to and in that process you start to have to look at well how will we deal with this kind of entity that we are currently sharing data with and part of that discussion is how publishers can share data with each other as well. Okay. Um, and yeah, no one really knows what's going on. <laughs> so just, just on the theme of data collaboration, there's another question for Ryan about DAX saying, does DAX re not really look to compete more with Spotify than it does with Google and Facebook? Um, to be quite frankly, we'd, we would take money from anywhere we can. So it doesn't matter if it's from <laughs> Google or if it's from Spotify or from anyone. I think the idea is to grow the market and make more money. Um, Absolutely. I think the key thing with Spotify, they've got a great product. They've got a slightly different way in which they go to market, but ultimately it's all audio budgets. What we don't want to do is start fighting with each other. We just want to grow the market to make more money. So that is through innovations, it's through data, it's through programmatic to make sure that it's as easy as ever to buy our inventory as it is to buy Google or Facebook inventory as well. So I guess the answer to that is we'll just... But take well, where comes. we can, yeah. We're not, we're not changing, we're isn't we're it? Proud. Sometimes you cooperate, sometimes you don't. <laughs> You know, it's not the, the, those old definitions of who exactly competes with who uh, are blurred now. Yeah. The world is different. Yes, yeah, it's, it's, it's being a, you know, even from an agency perspective, you've seen migrations of display teams. So, digital doesn't exist and video doesn't exist. It's a display team, meaning you just need to prove why you should be on a plan and or why you're not to be taken off a plan. I think that's the most important piece. So it doesn't matter if it's Spotify, if it's Google, Facebook, or Telegraph, or Guardian. We just need to ensure that we're giving some value back to the advertiser and the client. Okay. So I think we're, we're just about coming to the end of our session. And we've had some questions already off the floor. But if there are any other questions, please, please raise your hand and ask them of the panel. We've stunned you all into silence. <laughs> Come on, somebody's going to have a question. At the back there. Um, I've got a question about um, trading of this data. What does the panel think about the issues around transparency? Brian? Hey, don't ask me. I'm the really centre <laughs> of the agencies. Um, sorry, what, in terms of transparency, what do you mean? So, um, publishers coming together, calling potentially their data, but the way that data is used, I mm. guess there are still kind of question marks around the transparency of that. Um, and that <coughs> is inhibiting uh, you know, greater revenues. So yeah. things like the definition of a segment, how do you ensure consistency across publishers, that sort of thing? I guess there are different levels, though, aren't there, of, of what transparency is and how the data is used. You know, is my data merged and there's, does someone have sight of my data, another publisher? Uh, te there's technologies out there that, don't, that would allow data to be kept uh, uh, separate while still mapping together. Um, uh, the other part of it is that kind of wider perspective of, of, of what uh, Johan mentioned as data leakage. Uh, which, is the, which is going on now, you know, every day, uh, with uh, people that are building uh, products from publisher data. Mm. Uh, and that's something that needs to change. And, it's, and, and the legal uh, uh, world is going to help to change that. But also, uh, the need for a sort of clearer cooperation is yeah, going to change as well. Um, to, to, to give it 
a little bit more specific, uh, specific. Can't even say the word. <laughs> but to be more focused, I guess um, where so I work for Dennis Publishing. We're part of that. We're part of Pangaea. Um, we are a special interest publisher, so we've got very high value but small, discrete audiences. Um, I guess one of our concerns is uh, when we opt into alliances, um, how do we make sure that our audience data doesn't leak out and, and also doesn't get taken by secondary actors um, and effectively uh, used uh, without our knowledge? And I guess that's one of the primary concerns that we would have. Mm -hmm. Obviously, we're, we're, we're all in on alliances. Mm -hmm. We believe that collaboration is uh, a good way forward, but that is definitely one of the concerns that kind of holds us back a bit. Yeah, so for Live Ramp, we would come back to what I said earlier on, which is about how you as publishers looking to use your data, those two different levels, the application level of data, which I, which I think what I think you're talking about, how do you apply data, and there, there will be differences in value or perceived value between um, individual publishers based on engagement or the, the value of an audience um, versus what we've been talking about, which is the sharing of a common identity framework across publishers. Now, who's to say that a login on a Dennis site is worth more or less than a login on an FT site? If actually the end goal is that you will share that information oh, so you know individuals um, and the, the sum is greater than the, the parts, if that makes sense. So I, I think it comes down to you know, how you use it. I think there is room for a, a cooperative where you're using that to build that common sense of identity. And then individually, you're overlaying your own data on top of that framework, that identity framework, and you're able to realize specific value based on the insights, the analysis, the criteria that you alone uniquely can bring attached to the application level of your data, if that makes sense. Yeah. It's, a, it's also a massive piece of trust. You know, like us working together is, is massively trust. That no, that works in this world. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, I, I think one of the challenges with the it's... transparency and being it's collaborative and offering audience segments into the programmatic for ANC train desk to be able to buy. You know, that's one of the biggest concerns for like yourselves of what happens then to my data. Are they misusing it? Are they, how are they using it? When are they using it? How much are they using it? And I think that's probably ch a, ch a massive challenge about how we can make more money. We need to be able to trust when, once it goes into the programmatic sphere, I guess, what, yeah, what happens there are, then. There are mechanisms that are going to help you to trust a little bit more, right? Which is that um, up to now, people have been trousering your data, right? And therefore, you've uh, not brought all of it to the market, OK? Uh, but eventually, I guess, you know, we're going to approach a future where, the, where everything will be programmatic. And that will have meant that this practice will have been cleaned up, you know, whether it's by uh, identifying data flows or uh, contractual, uh, following up on contractual obligations and saying, actually, we're not going to allow that to happen and monitoring it, and, and, that, and that is about building a better ecosystem, that, which, which has to happen. A better market that we can all participate in that allows you know, proper premium data to flow, as it should do, and where it should do. That, that will happen, and there are tools that can help that to happen now, and GDPR helps it to happen. I would try to make sure that you document everything you do, um, and, and try to avoid as much um, uh, doubt about the interpretation because it's nice, the trust works on a personal level. I agree with that. And we need, you need people to, to trust people to start talking. But after that, the world is too big to trust because you and I can come to an agreement and your company and my organization, we can trust each other. But the third party who will be on board will be somebody who used to sell second-hand cars and is now into selling uh, banners on a, a totally corrupt site. So. Uh, this is not about trust, this is about documenting stuff and you can do this with big parties and this is where you start. Yeah. Because in the end I don't think uh, big corporations will deliberately uh, f uh, try to be fraudulent in this respect. Now, the other thing we've seen, and this is also simple, one day we have, it was last year, we did a test with uh, tags and we gave a tag uh, to somebody and said this is the kind of tag we would like you to install. And what they did is they exactly copied the tag. So all of a sudden, our Dutch Telegraph had about four times the reach because somebody just copied their tag. Now, this is not fraudulent. This is just stupid. <laughs> but stupidity can also be avoided by having things written down and on paper in or in contracts. Cool. So the red light has come on, which means we're going to start to wrap this up. So I think what I'll do is I'll ask each of the panel to give us their, their thoughts, their nuggets of wisdom in a in a concise manner in terms of 
what would you recommend to the publisher partners who are out here today? Dilip, do you want to start? Yeah, I mean, I've said it all. I you know, just want to find the ways that we can get to the table, start talking about how cooperation works, uh, see the, the money on the other side of the table and realise and get motivated and see how we can make it happen. Because all of the platforms and technology are there, so we have to have the idea of how it works. I would just say, I mean, particularly continue working collaboratively as possible to challenge the market. Key thing for me is just to make sure that open-minded about new ways, and it doesn't always have to be the way things have always been. New ways in which we can make money by using not only your data but also your insight. That's that's a key. We've got such a we're in such a precious position of premium publishers. We've got the access to all of this great content, great people, great users, great insight. It's holding on to that and making sure we're getting our money's worth for it. Johan, pearls of wisdom. Hmm. The, the, forget about beating Facebook and Google. Um, your job is to make a profit for your company. Um, and how you do this, there are many ways uh, of doing this. And I think there are ample opportunities uh, to do this. And you need to start working together, but start working on levels you can understand and you can work together on small uh, uh, areas of agreement. Find them, start working there. Then you build also some trust. And from there, you take it to the next level. Um, because you have to work together in this respect because the agencies will demand it um, and, and then you can also make much more money uh, and your bottom line is more important than the bottom line of uh, your competitors including, uh, what's the name, Google, Facebook, Small Amazon. Businesses. Let's leave that, what's their name? <laughs> yeah. cool. so, so for me, I, th I think the, the, the themes that have emerged quite consistently have been cooperation, trust, I love Dilip's phrase, treasuring the data, so I've learned something sitting up here today. <laughs> I'd like to thank all the panellists. I'd like to thank you guys for your time today. We'll call it a wrap. Thank you very much. Thank you.